Hello, Zach. Welcome to Helsinki. Hi, Linda. Yay. So I think we need to start with the story of how we met originally. And it's not a typical, we didn't meet at a tech conference, we actually met building something. Out in the woods. Out of the woods, yeah. You want to tell the story? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I, I lived most of my life in New York City, and, and um, after I sold Vimeo, I decided I wanted to get out of the city for a while and, and bought some property in upstate New York, uh, and I invited people to come learn how to build buildings with me. And you responded to an invitation I put out on the internet, anyone want to learn how to build a Zana? And, uh, and you, you traveled uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and helped me build one. Yeah, so as a Finn, I felt obligated to come and, and explain to the Americans how you actually build a sauna, but I did learn a lot. The thing I really like about you, Zach, is you contain multitudes. You've lived many lives and had many careers beyond college humor and Vimeo and now DIY. What do you think is sort of the glue that like, um, puts all of these things together? What is the, uh, the passion behind all of these different projects and lives you've led? <sighs> um. You know, I, th I think what's, um, well, I I'll say one of the reasons why I'm working on DIY now is because I, uh, I didn't succeed in traditional schools. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I, ne I never, you never would have found me at the top of the class. I wasn't an exceptional learner, but I was deeply passionate uh, about lots of things. And a lot of those things, like SimCity, uh, which I, I played lots of, um, weren't really understood or appreciated by, by adults in my life. So uh, when I, uh, I, I think I just was never really groomed for a conventional career and um, was often living in my own world. And when I became an adult, I think I just uh, kept repeating this pattern of finding uh, things that, that made me feel passion and um, uh, being fearless about, about stopping doing things when they stop making me passionate and, and, and moving on to, to the next thing. You can definitely relate to that. One of my personal childhood passions was Mr. Al Gore, and <laughs> like, I made websites for him, and now I, as an adult, like, I got to meet him, and I think that's, that's the thing. We don't know yet what kind of skills are going to be valuable for our careers or our lives as we go grow older. You also do quite a bit of investing and woodwork, as we discussed before. Uh, you lead companies, you build products. How do you think you get those skills to, to practice these new things, or you, especially if you're not born with the, the ability to, say, invest in companies? How do you get the skills? Well, I think that, that relates directly to, I think, the, uh, the topic of, of this chat, which is preparing kids for jobs that don't exist yet. I think um, you know, my, my, aunt, my succinct answer to that is that we need to use education as an opportunity not to impart any particular skill in children to depend on for the rest of their lives. What we need to do is, I, I feel, is uh, help children become fearless about learning because uh, we are living we are leaving the era in which you can depend on a single skill to last your entire lifetime. Mm. Uh, my dad's generation, they, they had an average of five jobs um, between the age of 18 and retirement. Uh, my generation in America, we will have 12 jobs between the age of 18 and retirement, and we should expect a similar increase for the coming generation. So I think it's... It's bizarre that we spend so much time trying to get children to arrive at this age of 18 where they become an adult, we push them out of home and school, and we ask them to choose a single skill that uh, they should depend on for the rest of their lives. Uh, when really what's going on in the minds of children is the, you know, they, uh, they're not monogamous to a single skill. There's actually many things in life that interest them, and often what teachers and parents are doing is discouraging variety mm -hmm. and insisting that they focus because mm -hmm. you need to be focused, the argument is, in order to be competitive. Why do you think focus is such a, like a highly valued skill in our, our society? Well, for that reason. It's because Specialization there in were, Yeah, there thing. were so few, previously, in previous generations, there were so few skills that you could actually make a livelihood from. And, uh, you know, 
what's happening is that the number of skills that you can, you can make a living from is fractalizing, and the skills that emerge are actually becoming outmoded really quickly. Mm -hmm. So when I was in, uh, in elementary school, a, a child, I was making websites, and that was unusual at the time. Mm. Um, and no one then knew what, web, you know, what web development was. That wasn't, that's still not something that's commonly taught in schools after decades, right? Mm. Uh, when I graduated college, uh, I did call myself a web developer. But even web developer sounds a little bit antique today, yeah. right? Uh, we're not talking about web development. We're talking about, at very least, mobile development most often. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so yes, skills are emerging, but they're also be becoming obsolete very quickly. Uh, and that's why I've sort of adopted a personal strategy. It's very deliberate, not to overinvest in a single skill, to make myself flexible and to really invest uh, in, in keeping myself in the position of being a beginner, because I think that, that sets me up for a lifetime of, of flexibility. What's the next skill or the next profession we're going to see you do? Uh, that's a great <laughs> question. Well, it's, I think the next thing I want to do, and this, this, this uh, ties back to what I actually do full time right now. Like right now I'm working um, on creating online learning uh, uh, services for children. Uh, I would like to take what I learned from um, these online services and build physical schools. Cool. Yeah, because I, that's actually, I think people are surprised that I, that I have this opinion, but I, you know, we always say at, at my company um, that we're trying to build the world's second greatest learning experience because we, we do believe that learning in person is the best way to learn, to learn with peers. It's an incredible social experience uh, to learn something together in a real space and collaboration. But it's not always possible for everyone everywhere to have that privilege of having a, uh, a school with peers that share the passion that you have. Yeah. So that's why online is so powerful, because you can live anywhere and you can go online and, and be anyone with any, anybody. Principal Zach Klein, I like the sound <laughs> yeah. of that. Um, if you were to design a school from scratch, uh, what would inspire you? Like, what books or philosophical movements or stuff like that? I'll let you think for a moment, because for me, for instance, I feel like I'm so inspired by the 50s and the 60s right now, not about like the current Silicon Valley trends, more about, say, like Reggio Emilia, which is this tiny town in Italy that came up with the idea that the child has a hundred languages to express themselves, whether it's sculpting or painting or coding or whatnot. So where, where, would you, where do you get like motivation or inspiration for the direction you're taking, whether it's DIY or, or a physical school? Yeah, I mean, I get most of my ins inspiration from games, actually. Ah, cool. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, games are actually, you know, we don't give them enough credit, and I, that's, that's not a new idea. Mm. Um, but they're, uh, in, incredible communities have been created around games, and, and me and, you know, and my colleagues, we were always looking at gaming communities to see how, uh, how um, reputation systems work. Okay, so let's do a deep dive into this because I think in Finland a lot of the discussion around gaming is around leaderboards, around like collecting points, around gamification. I think you have a more unique perspective into this. Well, what I love about gaming and, and honestly just um, any sort of creativity online is that uh, traditional, like, traditional classifications don't apply. Mm -hmm. So in the gaming world, for example, it's always extraordinary to, to find just, to learn just how young some of the best gamers yeah. are. <laughs> Ageism doesn't exist on the internet. Ageism doesn't exist uh, 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 in gaming. You can be excellent no matter how, how old you are. And often people don't care about your age. It's just not an important factor. It's how, it's how you perform. Uh, and what you have to contribute to the community that is that is so important. And it's it is a shame that we that we do need to masquerade who we are online in order to get that sort of respect. But I I think there's a lot to learn from um, uh, that lack of prejudice that that you find in online communities. What else uh, in gaming communities? Well, <laughs> um, 
You know, I think one thing is, I, and, and this is, I'm, it's very interesting to speak here in Finland because in Finland, I mean, in the United States, we often hold Finland in such high regard mm -hmm. uh, for your, uh, the effectiveness of your schooling system. So uh, when, I, when I make assumptions about schools here, I hope everyone appreciates that I'm, I'm coming from the perspective of the American school system. Um, you know, but one thing that is really disappointing about American schools is just how uh, there's a boss who sits mm -hmm. at the front and uh, they lecture and instruct, mm -hmm. and then they give a command, um, you know, homework, and all kids virtually turn in the same thing. Uh, and all kids are competing against each other. Uh, th there's two things there that I think I find pretty fascinating. All kids in the classroom are expected to be good at the same thing, but that is not really how uh, uh, real Unlike life them, plays yeah. out. Uh, in reality, we join groups um, in which we play a unique part, mm -hmm. we're uniquely good at things, and we are expected to collaborate and depend on other people uh, to, to work together to, as a team, create something bigger and better and more interesting than we could possibly do ourselves. But that sort of collaboration is often discouraged in classrooms. Mm -hmm. we, we all are expected to know the exact same thing and to be better than the next person at it. Right? And our success is actually measured in how often we're better than other people at, these, at skills we actually have no interest in being good at. And somehow school asks you questions that have already been answered a bazillion times ago and never encourages you to come up with your own questions and your own interests, which is so frustrating. Right, and that was the, the other thing I was going to say, is that often when kids turn in homework, you know, you know they everything that's turned in looks the same. It's, mm. it's already been done before, and often kids are, you know, the things that they make are prescribed, and the kids have no interest in each other's work. Mm. That's what I think is so cool about gaming and, and just online creative communities, is how much novelty there is in each other's work. Yeah. We, we love seeing what each other makes. You don't see that often in schools. And I think that's the thing with you and me, like we grew up in this internet of the 90s where you could, you were anonymous first of all, there was no like data trace of your identity online for the future to see and we were also allowed to experiment and create and also delete our own existence. How do you feel about the kids and the internet today where their experience is so much more curated and so much more contained, they watch YouTube videos and, and so forth? Could you expand on that a little bit? I think like the thing, I'm seeing online is that, and both online and offline, is that our kids are being more contained. They are not allowed to walk in the cities, but they are also not allowed to walk on the internet and, and experience things in the same way as we do. And, and somehow we have no ways of like preparing from the, them for that future. And I think one of the like beautiful things I like about DIY is that it offers kids this place where they can be creative online, where they can experience the internet we grew up with that doesn't really exist, that we kind of lost as we went on. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to give a little context for the audience. So one of the projects that I work on is called DIY.org, and and it is an, a totally open-ended uh, you know community where any child can join. It's a blank space; they can add anything to it. Often the things that they add or you know, that they share with the community are things that they're learning or things that they're passionate about. Kids can find other kids who share their passions. They can follow each other just like you would on, on Instagram. And they're often learning from each other. What are, they, like, what are the sad and strange things you've seen kids make on DIY? Or if that's too depressing a question, what are sort of the, the skills you see kids learning on DIY that you think are going to be the future web development skills, that, the skills that we don't appreciate yet, uh, that will someday become careers for these kids? Well, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll answer your first question, and you can stop me if, you, if oh. it is too depressing. But the, <laughs> the hardest thing about my job is that we are often having to play the role of surrogate parents. Because Aww. kids are spending so much time online, um, we, they're sharing a lot online, and me and my coworkers were absorbing all of this. The things and that happen on DIY can be as meaningful as on the playground or in right. schools. Right, and then the hardest part is that, especially in America right now, we're living through an extraordinary cultural moment where there's a lot of division within the country, and the conversations that are happening at the dinner table between parents are being repeated online by children, and uh, they don't necessarily understand um, the, the, the forces of these conflicts, they're just repeating 
what they've absorbed from their families. And these debates are being played out with children as proxies. And we, you know, it's, it's strange. We got into this to help kids learn creativity, but we've, we're often having to develop our own. We're having to learn on the job and learn how to deal with these conflicts that we didn't anticipate. Tell us something optimistic. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, one of my favorite things about the community is that the, um, so it is open-ended, kids can upload anything they want, but we, we try to, like, create pathways for them to learn new skills. So uh, they, we have all these different badges that you can earn by, by, uh, by completing challenges. And so one of the coolest things is when we, we have a new idea for a skill, we'll, it will create it and we'll put it online and then kids will do the challenges, right? And there's 600,000 kids on the community, so wow. inevitably, anything we add will get tried by someone. And I was just telling someone backstage, one of my favorite things we just did is uh, we introduced the reader skill. The so reader it's, skill. Not, it's not about teaching you how to read, but uh -huh. it's, it's, uh, they're challenges for people who are really passionate about, about uh, reading or, or, or fiction. So, you know, one of the challenges would be write an extra chapter for a book that you love. Oh, I would have loved that. Or <laughs> cook a meal from a book that you've read. But the last challenge for the reader skill is to build a library. And so what was awesome about this was that on Friday, we, we introduced the skill. We, we announced it to everyone in the community. On Monday, I came in and several dozen kids had built libraries over the weekend. They had put dressers and wardrobes out in their front yard, painted it, uh, had marked all the shelves with the different categories of books, and had just put signs that say free books. And we'll, we'll continue building a library with you on the QA uh, stage afterwards this. I think the final question for the day is, if childhood is the original adventure, if we're preparing our kids for a future where we don't know the skills, I think we need to try to answer this question of the discussion. What are the future skills our kids should learn? Well, I, 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 I'm going to echo or repeat some of the things I said earlier in our conversation, which is I, I, I think it's, we first need to accept that the role of education is to help kids thrive for the rest of their lives. And we have been leaning on too long a strategy of overemphasizing uh, some skills that were important in a different era. And uh, given that... No one, I mean, we would all be very wealthy and successful if we were good at producing the future. This entire conference is, is based, is built upon this idea of us being, uh, uh, you know, it's basically a fetish of the future. But, it, but that's what makes it so interesting. We don't know what's coming. And so I, I think we should accept that, that, that we, and we should uh, uh, find tactics that are less focused on, on helping kids learn specific kids skills and, um, uh, more uh, interested in helping kids become fearless learners. Help them anticipate that what they're passionate about now uh, may not be the thing they're passionate about 20 years from, from now, and that there will be a, a strange journey for them uh, in, in finding and recreating livelihoods for themselves. They're going to have multiple livelihoods over their lifetime. For strange journeys and great adventures. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Linda. <laughs>